So, how many people have noticed that things are speeding up a bit? Pace of life, change. Some of you here are probably old enough to remember writing letters, you know, paper, pen, you wrote a letter, you put it in an envelope, you looked up the address on a card index, you wrote it, you put a stamp on it, you put it in the mailbox, and maybe three or four days later you get a reply. Now, you know, you email, send it off, and like, you haven't heard from them in half an hour, you start texting them, did you get my email? <laughs> but it's not just there, it's like, throughout life there's just more and more things to do, more and more things to take care of, we seem to be under more and more pressure to make decisions faster, and less and less time to do it all in. And we're all feeling this in our lives, but this is not just a 21st century phenomenon or even 20th century phenomena. It goes back all the way, this speeding up of the rate of development. I mean, things today are much faster than they were 200 years ago after the Industrial Revolution, but that was then, things were much faster then than they were 2,000 years ago. In fact, if you put, going back even further, you put the whole of the history of life on Earth into a one-year film. So the whole of the, hist of the four and a half billion years of Earth you make into one-year film. Then the first six months, well, the first few months, the first month or so is nothing, and then the first six months is just simple cells, and then they start forming multicellular organisms. In December, dinosaurs appear, Human beings are somewhere around 20 minutes before midnight on the last day of that year-long film. And then civilization is about 20 seconds before then. The Industrial Revolution, just a few seconds before then. And the whole of modern history, our lives, are just half a second in that year-long film. We are just a blink in the eye of God. In fact, in Indian teachings, it says human beings are a blink in the eye of God. If you think how long it takes you to blink out of a lifetime, that is how long you are in the life of the planet. A bl literally a blink. Now, this speeding up, it's, it's inevitable and it's completely natural. It's because each new innovation, each new development just paves the way for future development, which paves the way for them to come faster and easier. And I mean, a good example of this is the shift from the, the Industrial Revolution to the Information Revolution. In the Industrial Revolution, we had to invent mass production, factories, mass distribution systems, all of that, and that took you know, 50, 100 years more to develop. When we come to computers, information revolution, we didn't need to redevelop factories and mass distribution and all that. We just plugged computers into it. And so the whole computer revolution could happen that much faster. And now as we're entering what I see as the intelligence age, that's, we don't need to reinvent computers to do that. We just start using them in different ways. And that's going to happen even faster still. And whenever you get this phenomenon of positive feedback, it's called in mathematics, where one, whatever's happening makes it easier for the next situation, which makes it easier for the next situation. Whenever you get positive feedback, you get what's called exponential growth. And so we are living in the exponential growth of technology, science, information. It's all exploding. And that means when we look to the future, it's going to be even more so. So, you know, whatever... We look at just the last 30 years. 30 years ago, none of us probably had even... even the internet didn't exist. Well, the internet existed. The World Wide Web didn't exist. Probably none of us had heard of email, very few of us. But, you know, online shopping, streaming videos, all the stuff we now take for granted, nobody was imagining. Now, you can press that, what's going to happen in the next 15 years. We can't imagine where that's going. 
and the time after that, even harder to imagine. And the stuff Don Hoffman was talking about in terms of artificial intelligence, all of that's going to be happening, and more. And probably maybe 10, 15 years, we'll have computers which are as good at any task, mental task, as, as the human brain. That's what people call the singularity, when we have ultra-intelligent computers. And then, who knows what's going to happen then? But one thing is for sure, it's going to be even faster. And the human mind just can't really grasp where things are going. But the point is we're just winding up faster and faster and faster and faster in this evolutionary spiral. And some of it is exciting, and some of it is very scary, you know, where that technology is going. But I don't want to look at that so much today as another aspect of it all, which is very seldom looked at and is much more challenging to our vision of the future. And where I want to go with this, I know some of you are going to find it pretty uncomfortable. You may disagree with me. Um, but I just, I just want to share how I see things and, and allow you to maybe take this wherever it goes in your own thinking. Because the side of this that isn't looked at is the, the stress that ever-accelerating change puts on the systems. Now, stress very generally can be defined as the failure to adapt to change. It, it, we see that in the individual, if, if we're not adapting to the changes that are coming, we get more stress with all the negative impacts, whether it's physiological, health, psychological. And many people are feeling that, that stress in their own lives in terms of just the acceleration. But the whole of the ecosystem, the planetary system, other species, they are also suffering the stress of this acceleration. And I say the, the acceleration is inevitable, but also I think the stress is inevitable, and that's the bit that we, we don't normally look at. And it's basically the planetary systems are failing to adapt to the change that humanity is creating. And we talked this morning a lot about climate change. It's, it's in the air, not just here, but it's almost like the number one issue at the moment is climate change. Climate change is a direct result of accelerating development. Carbon dioxide, natural gas, it's always being produced. In the past, the planet just absorbed it quite happily through plants and things. But now we are producing carbon dioxide thousands of times faster than the planet can absorb it. And that's why we have climate change, because it's building up. And we all know this. And it's accelerating still. The rate at which we're producing carbon dioxide is on its own accelerating curve. And that's just one example. Almost everything we can see in terms of the crises facing us, whether it's pollution, ocean plastics, the loss of species, the loss of resources, all these different facets of the global crisis, nearly all of them, in one way or another, come back to the fact that we're on this ever-accelerating spiral of development. And so what I see is the crisis we're facing, not so much the individual crises, but the whole global set of crises are really the symptoms of the acceleration. It's, it's a crisis of acceleration we're facing. And the bit that's hard in this, I think, initially to get is that this is unavoidable. This is what happens with a technologically empowered species that's innovating. The innovations produce more innovations which speed things up. It's inevitable that things speed up. And so you've got two threads going together. You've got the acceleration of knowledge, science, technology, and you've got the acceleration of the degradation. The two things happen in parallel. 
And the old question that's often asked is, how is it that the smartest, intelligent, most creative, etc., etc., species on this planet is also the most dangerous species on this planet? It's not an either-or thing of what went wrong. It's these two things come together. I don't think, I don't think anything has gone wrong. There's no blame in this. It's so easy when we start looking around at what is happening to start getting angry and start blaming the, whether it's the politicians, the corporations, the money, the institutions, our self-centeredness, where we went wrong in history. What I'm feeling more and more is there is, there is no blame for where we are. What we really need almost is to learn the opposite, which is forgiveness, is to be able to understand how we got here and to be able in a way to forgive ourselves rather than looking for the blame of what went wrong out there. And the challenge then becomes, how do we respond to this? How, how, do, we, how do we begin to relate to the future, seeing that these two trends are intimately wound together. The acceleration of knowledge, science, technology, culture is intimately wound up with the accelerating degradation, the unraveling. The, the two are intimately bound together. How, how do we respond to that? The initial response I'm finding is um, grieving. And we, we, again, we touched on that this morning, just in that um, panel discussion. It, so many things that people are grieving about, the gloss. I think we need, this is going to become more and more important to actually allow in the sorrow. I know psychologist friends of mine say more and more people are coming to them, more and more clients are coming with sort of a global angst. It's not just you know, their relationship troubles, it may be their relationship troubles as well, various things, but more and more people are coming with a deep global angst about what is happening. And I think it's going to be more and more important. How do we find ways to allow this global angst out, to, to get in touch with our sorrows? I mean, I know I say this, I'm, you know, it's, a, it's a challenge for me. How, how do I allow in the sorrow of what's happening? Because we know that if we block sorrow, it just holds back our vitality, it holds us back. We have to find ways to, to allow in the sorrow, rather than just glossing things over and say it's all going to be okay, if we just change our consciousness, if we all just wake up, we're going to create a wonderful new world. No, we've got to actually come out of denial and begin to face what's happening. I think this is, this is going to be really important. And in a way, coming to an acceptance, as, as we do in grieving, we ultimately come to an acceptance of how things, how things are. We're, we're grieving a, a lost person or something. It's like coming to an acceptance of this is what it's like to be a technologically empowered species as it spirals faster and faster and faster into this whirlpool, to come to some form of deep acceptance of this. And then the question is, how do we respond as individuals? How, how do we navigate this? And for me, trees are a wonderful example, or forests of trees. I spent a lot of my life living in the middle of a forest, in a cottage in England, in the middle of a forest. And I watched storms come through, and I noticed several things. You know, firstly, obviously, if a tree is going to withstand a storm, it needs to have strong roots, it needs to be grounded. It needs to have strong roots, it needs to be grounded. I think we, we need that, we need to be grounded in ourselves, because we've got a storm of change coming. If we're gonna face that, we need to just be grounded in ourselves, know, know our deeper being. But trees also need to be flexible to bend with the, to bend with the wind. And then we need to, I think, have this similar thing. We need to be flexible in ourselves, which is about letting go of the old ways of doing things, the ego's idea of what is right and how to do things. We've got to let go of so much of our traditional, conventional, egoic thinking and be prepared to be completely fresh in how we approach things. 
Trees also, community is important. I mean, a tree on its own can't stand a gale. Trees in a forest, they protect each other. And that is, I think that's one thing that more and more people are seeing, is we need community to see us through. I have a friend who lived through the wars in Yugoslavia. Through, it's a whole other story of what she lived through. And I asked her once, I said, how did you get through all that? And she said it was community. It's better to sit down with friends and have a cup of tea or get support from my friends. And the other thing that I noticed is I could be in the forest in the middle of a raging storm in my cottage and it was still, down at the ground, in the middle of the forest, it was still. And I think more than everything, anything, what we need is to be able to keep coming back to that inner stillness. That's, that's what will hold us, is to better come back to the stillness in ourselves. So that as things are getting crazier and crazier, how do we come back to the stillness? And what this means really is now, like never before, is the time where our spiritual work really becomes critical. This is the time where we need to put into practice in ourselves and helping others. And I, I would just say, what, whatever it is you are learning here this, these few days that helps you be more stable in yourself, more flexible, more open, more loving, more caring, touching into the stillness more, whatever that is, take that and put it into practice. It's, it's so, so important. And what this leads me to, just in a sense, to put in a more... It isn't all doom and gloom, this. I see it also as doom and light. Things are going to get crazy. I really see that. And there's another exponential curve that's happening, which is the exponential growth of consciousness, of awakening. I mean, when I started in all this area 50 years ago, there was hardly anything on the spirituality stuff we're talking about. There was a bookshelf that long in, my, in the Cambridge bookstore, which is the second biggest bookstore in England at the time. You know, now you go into any town, you find bookstores full of books on contemporary spirituality in one form or another. And there's not just books, there's videos, there's the internet full of teachings and stuff. It is exploding. And it's not just the amount of books and lectures and videos and teachings. It's the number of people. And again, there's that positive feedback. We are all continually learning from each other. You are here learning from many, many other people about what has helped them in their spiritual growth. So that is also on an accelerating curve. So at the same time as we have this winding up of technological growth, science, and we have the also winding up of the stress of that, we also have an equal acceleration in consciousness. Where that's leading I don't know, but I see if there's, a, if there's a purpose to consciousness, it is really coming to a full knowing of ourselves. Not just a full knowing of the world, but coming to a full knowing of who we are. And if you, that is what is going to help us through these times. And just to, to finish, I'd just like to sort of come back to a bigger picture of what, it, what I see happening in the, in the cosmos, a way of reframing this for me. People talk a lot about you know, the new story of human consciousness, but very often the new story is how you know, we're going to make everything okay and we're all going to sort of live happily ever after, to put it very simplistically, but it's based on linear time. But I see a new story based on exponential time that the, the cosmos, with these billions of planets, occasionally life appears, and occasionally that life develops to the stage where consciousness begins to start waking up, technology happens, and it's like a bud of creative intelligence appears on that planet, and it starts 
blooming and blossoming in just a fraction of cosmic time. And that's where we are. We're in this moment in cosmic history where this bud of consciousness is flowering with us now in us. And it's the image I, I'd like to leave you with is the century plant. Some of you, the century plant is that agave plant which flowers. It's called the century plant because it flowers every 100 years. It doesn't. It flowers once in 18 or 20 years. But the plant is growing just gently. And then suddenly, one year, it puts up this huge stalk and hundreds of flowers, like 10, 15 feet up in there. This whole sort of tree of flowers suddenly appears after all this time. And we don't say oh my God, it's going to stop. You know, I wish this flower would stay here forever. We don't. We say, wow, isn't that amazing? And what I, what I feel for myself, it's time to say, it's not like, oh, I wish, we could, I wish all this would go on for millions and millions of years. It's like, now let us, can we just rejoice and celebrate this incredible species, being that we are, and all that we are still capable of. Can we rejoice in being here, in being alive at this time? Thank you. Thank you.